Kia, great to have you here uh, in in sort of this virtual art rapture scenario and and uh, studio. It's a pleasure to be meeting with you again, and I cannot wait for this print run collaboration that we're doing together. And uh, why don't we just kind of kick off by seeing sort of where are you at right now? Are you in New York? Yeah, yeah, I'm at in uh, my apartment um, in Bushwick. In Bushwick, perfect, which is fantastic because actually that's the area where we've got these print runs coming from is yeah, Bushwick. Yeah, it's just it happens to be a crazy coincidence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I literally walked down the road and uh, checked them out. Love it. Well, I'm glad you got your hands on those prints, and I appreciate you taking some photos of the artwork and uh, doing some some wild sort of uh, photo op backdrops with a whole bunch of prints, almost like wallpaper, and having <laughs> you holding the print in front, which is pretty rad. So, thanks for for extending that effort and making that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was fun to to play around with the imagery. So yeah, having the three colors really is something I've never seen anyone do. And it really adds like um, a lot of depth to it because even though it's the same image, they have totally different feelings like attached to them for me anyway. Absolutely. And that's something, you know, Ryan and I have learned from our time as of, of being art dealers for over 15 years now. One of the great art movements is fauvism which is the wild beasts of color. And the word fauve is a French word meaning wild beast. And the real sort of artist that catapulted fauvism forward was Matisse. And Matisse really leveraged color as a language. And so prior to sort of fauvism, there was obviously realism and then there was impressionism. And impressionism was quite radical because it wasn't really depicted in, in strict lines. Uh, whereby you would create these very realistic images and they were bending the boundaries of art at that time and and creating this visual interpretation of a feeling of a scene as opposed to the actual um, literal visual interpretation of a scene. And then fauvism comes along and uses color as a way to express emotion and express express uh, communication through color. So using harsh reds as you know, almost an essence of angst and pain and then very soft blues and, and, and rose colors to create this almost euphoric calmness with art. And so I love that you brought that up, that even with exactly the same image represented in three different color palettes, that we actually have a, a, a different level of communication and feeling from the artwork itself. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, well, let's kick things off, man. Like, tell me a bit about yourself. So, you know, what, what's your background as a child? Where did you grow up? You know, what, how, how did sort of art become part of you? Yeah, I think that it was always like a, a form of language to me. Like, I could kind of draw before I was able to articulate a lot of things that I was processing. And because both my parents were very early on into graffiti and then muralism, tattoos, and like to some degree, like my dad sign painting, all these different um, cultures blended together into the universe that I'm creating now. And yeah, I think it's, it's just been like a very organic, autodidactic um, type of journey that makes sense in retrospect. But at the time I had no, real vision outside of just the necessity that I had to create manically. Like I wasn't really thinking long term or strategically. It's all just been like a domino effect of impulse. And a natural process. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is really something I try to keep true to, like making um genuine creative decisions that stem from like a place of resonance emotionally rather than thinking about like the the way that the world is or what will be received well i think it's always good to to try find like what's true yeah. that's well said i mean for me when i get excited about an artist and the artwork they create is i truly want to see the essence of their soul and there are certain artists that paint one specific way their entire career because consistency for them is what 
maybe sort of quote unquote pays the bills or what they're known for. And they're kind of scared to veer away from that. But when I look at the great artists, whether it be fine art or whether it be, you know, music or theater or acting, it's the artists that bent the boundaries and, and really allowed themselves to communicate outwards and show their vulnerability and, and, and communicate to people in a way that they weren't afraid or maybe they were, but weren't, weren't um, going to allow to put themselves within a box of what deemed to be successful or well-received, but actually bent those boundaries and allowed themselves to speak, you know, fluently and clearly through their medium of artwork, like the Beatles, you know, they've changed their, they changed their style so rapidly uh, in a way that perhaps, you know, many of their fans from the early days would not like albums like Sgt. Pepper's. We look at Picasso and Picasso, you know, created these periods like Rose period and Blue period and then neoclassicism, which was really a throwback to the Renaissance artists and, 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 and Greco-Roman classicism, but then completely changed his style a couple of years later and did Cubism. And fans of Cubism aren't necessarily fans of, you know, neoclassicism and vice versa. And so my point is, is, is I love it when artists, like you say, are true to themselves and aren't constantly thinking of the commercial value or, or the way in which the external world will receive their work, but rather are true to their own internal identity because that's the beauty of what art is. It really is a form of communicating. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, a lot of my heroes even like who are successful and have reached like a status where they kind of could just keep um, checking in. Like, I think a lot of them have now like experimented more, even if they're keeping like the, the brand identity that they've built like a legacy to alive without like completely giving up on it. Cause I mean, it's sentimentally like super emotionally gratifying to have like um, your work reach people and like mean so much. So in some ways it's not necessarily like the worst thing if you keep some of it going, but just finding a way to to like express yourself, I think is, mm -hmm. is really cool. Most definitely. So let, let's go back to sort of your early mm -hmm. days, right? So your mm -hmm. mother's an artist, you know, Faith 47, phenomenally successful. Wow. We actually have one of her murals next to the building that I work out of in an area called Mount Pleasant in Vancouver which is, I believe, of an antelope. And uh, then I believe, if you, if I'm not mistaken, your father's a tattoo artist? Yeah, and a muralist as well. And a muralist, okay. So, so you're now growing up and you've got these very um, in tune artistic personalities that, are, that you're growing up around and being raised by. Can you sort of reflect back onto almost your earliest days as a human being of, you know, did you get joy and passion out of, you know, getting handed crayons and pencils and drawing for your parents? Because it's usually like I'm a father of a six year old and three year old and their joy is like creating something and giving it to my wife and I to enjoy. Yeah. Like, can you reflect on that? Do you actually have no, quite, quite literally? That? Yeah, quite literally. Like I was at graffiti jams that would happen like every weekend. And I was just so bored that I would like steal spray cans with all the other like kids that lived in the neighborhoods and then just start like trying to draw stuff and then as i got better they'd let me like paint something nearby and it it literally evolved from like that like early age until like the same thing sort of occurring when i was like hanging out with my mom and she was painting i just got bored enough that it, it seemed necessary i always drew but yeah. like the I think boredom or maybe just this this infinite space and this feeling of time being so like expansive that you could rarely sit with yourself and then from there it just it, it becomes so obvious what's inside you that like you want to share and I mm -hmm. think like yeah that's that's maybe something that like I think every kid should experience is just like a, a stillness and like this place to really grow like an inner world. And I'm so glad that I, I had that, but it definitely right. was just out of necessity. There was just no one to take care of me. So they just were like, you're coming. 
you you, yeah. you touched on something that actually you know moves me is is the comment around you know every it would be nice if every child could experience you know a stillness and i think of sort of the chaotic world that we're all involved in at times and to be a kid is is quite precious and there's a lot of innocence and purity around being a child but it can also be chaotic for children too with the amount of information they're receiving the speed in which their parents and family are operating the speed in which uh you know education systems are moving and it's not always easy to find you know that that solace and and that time for reflection and that stillness and and i think that's a, a beautiful way of putting it and I, I, it's something that actually resonated with me really well to think about it as a father so you know thanks for sharing that i want to uh, talk about you know growing up in south africa so uh, you know, as you know, my wife is from Durban, South Africa. I've been to South Africa five times. Uh, it's a very special country that's very dear to my heart. Uh, when I talk to people about, you know, what is it like to visit South Africa? Um, for me, the first reaction I have is, is when I land on an airplane lands in either Joburg or, or um, in Chaka, you know, international airport in Durban, um, there is a heartbeat that like hits me as soon as I land where I genuinely feel the continent of Africa and I haven't explored all of Africa, but you know, the, the country of South Africa, it hits me like it's almost the heart of earth. And it, it is such a warmth and, and a wonderful feeling of, of culture and richness and 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 joy as i sort of land in that country to go explore this sort of phenomenon that most of us western world you know natives of north america and europe don't always have the luxury of experiencing and you grew up in that country and so you know where in south africa did you predominantly grow up if only one place tell us you know the multiple places uh and then how has the culture of of South Africa influenced your work? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I grew up in Cape Town and so I had like a very, very unique experience, I think. Like my my parents were super young at the time too. They had me when they were like teenagers. And so I was very much immersed in their world of like just young artists trying to make it. And I got to see just like the the true like realities of the of the country in some way just like traveling around and like being in like lots of different environments when they were painting like murals and like doing graffiti and going to like b-boy jams and like all these different things and yeah it, it gave and me was like, that mostly a cape town region or did you also go yeah. outside of there two places I, like Joburg or Port Elizabeth, you know, yeah. East London, I mean, wherever, right? Yeah, yeah. As I got older, I'd visit Joburg more and more and like made friends out there. But like, um, yeah, I think in general, it's it was mostly just I lived in Cape Town. But like, yeah, there's a ton of back and forth, especially with all the arts going on. Um, I'd say like Johannesburg is probably more influential, but like, because they have a relationship, I think like the two cities kind of complement each other and like without both, like you wouldn't get like the full experience of like the nature side that like you don't get in Johannesburg too. Yeah. And um, yeah, but but yeah, Cape Town and Joburg and uh, Durban too, like I've spent time in. And I think, yeah, the, the main thing that like I really miss about like being in South Africa was the community and this like lineage of um, like arts and like how much effort and how much meaning came from everything you did because okay. of how necessary it is to be creative um, and the, the lack of infrastructure and funding and like opportunities and people who have demonstrated success in um, mediums that haven't ever been like explored like street art is exactly current still like there's very few people who have been able to carve a pathway for it and like yeah painting there really like felt so necessary because every kid that like i'd interact with would like come and bring his drawings from his house and like yeah it felt felt super special to like have a relationship with um 
people for my whole life and kind of give back. But, but now, like, I think having seen more um, and, like, come back and forth, it's kind of hard to go back because the the art world is very in, insular and, like, right. you can kind of help more by being in another country and, like, kind of building bridges and putting people forward and, like, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, when I do go back, like it's so inspiring. So like it's it's always like a push and pull. Like I think there'll just be times to to kind of like um, re re experience it more. Or but yeah, Question it's a hard one to explain. Side, honestly, yeah. Kind of side note: Have you been to the Zeitz Mocha Museum? Yeah, yeah, the so good. Main towers. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I went there. It must have been like five years ago now. Yeah. My daughter was crawling then. And I went on my own and it blew me away. Like I I've been to a lot of museums and it was just something so special to see how they repurposed grain towers they, like, into a museum <laughs> and the quality of art from African people all over the continent of Africa was explosive. Like it really moved me. I thought it was fantastic. So anyone who's yeah. maybe listening to this, if you go to Cape Town, you must, must, must visit the uh, Zeitz Mocha Museum in, in Cape Town. Yeah, yeah. No, it's insane. I mean, like the art there is insane. I was more just talking about street art hasn't really got a legacy past just like graffiti because right. the, the concept is so new, like in a lot of Okay, places. okay. So from, so when we're talking about, you know, the traditional method of street work, uh, yeah. you know, getting a, a spray can, kind of tagging type work versus the very eclectic nature that we see in North America and, and Europe with artists of many different styles and background you're saying in south africa it's you're seeing more of a, a consistent sort of theme across street art and you're not finding a lot of unique identities between individuals other than you know a certain style yeah. or, or you well, elaborate just like yeah no one really has been able to make a living off it and therefore wow. like there's very few people who have been able to even stick with it long enough to like build a okay. career or so everyone that like I see do it, it's like um, very meaningful to me. And like I stay in contact and support heavily because it, it would be so great to have these stories told internationally more, but that just yes. isn't necessarily like the the scaffolding for it. They're starting to be, but like it's yeah. early days. And I think one of the greatest to... ways is I think if you actually use yourself as a, as a model for what is the possible, right, is to look at you know, street artists that could try, you know, I how turn the you light on it. I just noticed it's super dark. Okay, no problem. I'm going to take a little pause here too and refill. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's good. So back to um, sort of the model, right? So it's like, and I think about this for digital artists too, which I'm starting to see percolate more and more is artists have a certain medium that they are really good at, but are almost reluctant or battle to venture into new mediums to express themselves. And what I really appreciate about yourself is not only are you an exquisite muralist, but as you see behind you working with tapestries, and also with ceramics and also with paintings and also with prints and i think if i were to provide like lend a piece of uh advice and i'm sure you're doing the same is like as you're talking to these great artists in south africa that are phenomenal muralists is like sample working on paper sample working on canvas sample working on found objects sample trying to create your your own uh, soul through communication through some type of sculpture. Uh, and that will allow them to really start getting the engines moving and, and possibly spark some new invigoration in their work before any sort of monetary value comes to play. And you know, at that point, if you start seeing artists that excel 
in that multi-medium process, you know, please, you know, educate uh, Ryan and I from Art Rapture about those individuals because we'd love yeah, to explore. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there is actually a lot of people, yeah, that are like starting um, to do really great stuff. And um, you're right. I do think that like material is like one of the main things that like really helps people explore and find like things that really resonate with them because you kind of limp of it obviously like once you have something you feel safe and it's hard to start from scratch but it's the yes. starting from scratch that even makes you feel things like you first did and i think having like a cycle of exploration keeps yourself alive and in touch with what you're doing and not being Most repetitive or yeah and yeah, I also just think the histories of every medium are so paralleled and like within them, there's so much you learn about yourself each time. That's why I really love ceramics and like learning about America through the lens of the history of ceramics has been like incredibly meaningful and like kind of grounded me to um, New York in, in ways that I didn't think were possible. Like right. there's whole worlds in every avenue, even screen printing and and text, like, yeah, tech, like artists who like just zoom into one specific thing. I think it's really beautiful the, the like, like links you have to different people that you didn't realize were there when you start to, to explore these. You're, new you're speaking avenues. my language. And, um, you know, it, it's quite interesting when I even think of some of the very talented artists, you know, even we work with. That predominantly in in one example only work with a canvas or linen medium and when they create prints they may only do inkjet replications of their paintings as the print and for me it's like when i'm talking with them you must stretch beyond that boundary because a print should be created for the purpose of a print because the print is an artistic medium itself it's not it's not for me a way to do replications it's actually a way to create something new for the purpose of print just like you would create a sculpture for the purpose of sculpture and it's not always easy to get people to get out of that comfort zone in that box and to think about ways to create their own identity uh and, and vision through other mediums and i you know as i listen to you I appreciate you in, in the way that you are not afraid to explore many different mediums with the way you create your art. And on that note, uh, as we sort of, you know, get moving along and some of the questions I'd like, I'd like to ask you is, um, you know, what artists inspire you and how would you describe your art? Yeah. I mean, my, my biggest inspiration is broken fingers who, um, are like, so innovative and like since I was really young always have been like and and seeing what they're doing now has like linked up with my practice really in ways that I, like I I never thought because like they have such a relationship with going like to to the extremes in murals like scale wise and textures and color and then putting that onto their fine art and back and forth but now they've kind of like gone on each artist like of the four have gone their own roots and it's been like really beautiful to see like the things that connected them and now as they pull away slightly like getting more experimental and then how that applies to their new murals and experimental projects and ceramics and stop frame wow. animation and stuff so yeah they're high up there ischemias have always been like yeah like top i think because like when you come to vancouver you've got to see yeah. the grain silos they painted in uh, yeah. Grand Island. they're absolutely massive uh, it was a huge treat i think it was seven years ago or something like that that we had them here in vancouver painting these grain silos and made each silo into its own unique character and oh, wow. uh yeah. unfortunately in vancouver there's not not enough people are astute in uh art appreciation to even know how important it was to have them come from Brazil to Vancouver, which is a very small city in the realm of the art world, uh, to have artists of that caliber located here. It was, it's a, an absolute treasure for our city. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one in Manhattan too that every time I'm like, oh my god, like I wish I lived like right next to this building because it's just like it makes everything so exciting to me. Yeah, because like it's yeah, so, so both of us are smiling right now, just thinking about it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Um, okay, so that's great. Now, what about what yeah. about um, any like old masters? Do you, do you ever look back on you know classic artists or you know the golden uh, Dutch era or impressionists? Yeah. I or mean, Cubist? I mean, in in theory, I really like the pre-Raphaelites because they have like this archaic revivalist sort of ethos to them, and that kind of is succinct with my work. And like once I started reading about that it aligned with everything I was doing. And um, yeah, it's it's really beautiful because like it takes like a bunch of different artists who are anti art of the time that basically uplifted like the upper class and put them in paintings with all of like religious figures. And basically they started painting like everyday people and gave power to the people. But alongside that, they also like thought of decorative items that were like within architecture and like even just like masonry and like things that everyone needed to use were like the most important functions of society and so like design that had public utility kind of informs the way that we feel and think and so like painting murals i often have to consider this balance of like wanting to push something that I feel like it's deep within me and in the unknown, but also finding a balance of like a restorative and like um, kind of like calming to the chaos of like modern life. And like mm. having having that branch has really been beautiful to me. But, yeah. Um, but also, yeah, just like lots of random people here and there. I, I like the Renaissance in the fact that like there was so much competition and camaraderie throughout all the painters and um i i try to really do that in terms of like having like a healthy relationship with like all my friends who coming up with me and like kind of putting them on and also being like checking them when they're like getting <laughs> sloppy or like well, trying to competition brews the best results and if you can be friends <laughs> If you can be amicable and even close friends with your competition, you know, yeah. I think that's that's a great, uh, great vein uh, for success. Yeah. And we look at uh, some of the great rivalries in the history of art with, as an example, Picasso and Matisse. I mean, they were at each other's necks uh, for a period of time in the early 1900s, exploring different mediums and almost... Uh, mimicking each other's styles as a way to prove to the other that they're better than them or their last painting and it would go back and forth and back and <laughs> forth and what did we get we get you know two blockbuster artists that you know in a city like vancouver if you have even a couple matisse or a couple picasso on exhibit in our our local art gallery you get lineups around the block i mean it's 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 astonishing right i mean it's it's truly special so i i love hearing that about um, you know, feeding off each other, competition, and also staying close to to others uh, to constantly push yourself. And I think that's where you get great art. That's where you get great communication is you're constantly pushing those boundaries and pushing yourself to be better. Um, so so that, yeah. that that's fantastic. I want to go into right now, before we go into the print run uh, and, and the imagery within that print run, a while back you told me uh, a time in which you worked at Subliminal Projects. Uh, which is a, a gallery and art studio uh, created by the world-renowned artist Shepard Ferry, aka the creator of Obey, Obey Giant, for those of you that don't know uh, Shepard Ferry. And can you tell me a bit about that experience and how it shaped you as an artist? So I actually worked for Shepard as a, a studio assistant and then helped on like one or two murals. So the gallery is part of his like company, but um, it's a separate like segment to it. I did a show there uh, recently, but it's separate. Um, but yeah, working for Shepard was really beautiful because like at the time, like I had this this like perspective of the, the art scene, but like being there for the amount of time I was and seeing the day to day and like the intricacies of like every step of the process and like how you deal with all these people. And also the beauty of like 
everyone rooting for him and being like connected by like the impact of the work and the messages behind it with it was really like profound i think i also took away from it that like this thing had been built so successfully that like what i wanted to explore was like something that like added to this legacy in a way and like for me it's been almost like moving towards whatever I see street art evolving into. And in some ways for me, it's been like connecting it to design ceramics and like other histories of outsider artists, folk artists and contemporary um, elements of society that are now finding like new ways to express themselves in youth mm -hmm. culture and for people who are finding like um, a way to like bring back like handmade items and objects and like a sense okay. of um, human connection through creation. And nice. I think all these things have kind of been in the precipice of expression, but are finding like a new terminology as they become more and more necessary. And like just learning in general, it feels close to something that I feel like I need to be a part of as I necessary that. was as an evolution of graffiti when it yep. was first created, you know? Do you do you feel like that time that you were there with all of the learnings you just spoke about helped shape you are who you are today? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so yeah, just being in LA at that time, that whole time period was like incredibly important and like um, contextualized the way I see art, like, because before that, like in South Africa, I had been like idolizing the art world and like projecting a lot, but like getting to see the beauty and like humbleness and just like the basic human connection to all of it and how how like gentle and fragile a lot of what you think of as like um, just like a monumental artist like they're just a person and every single one is just like you. It, it just made it so so like real for me that like i felt like i could kind of contextualize it and and in some ways feel like i had new space to explore because like i understood it in a very human way and nice. and that's really the biggest thing i gained being being in that environment in la and yeah i just think it's it's so exciting like the amount of love and attention um and connection that has been built by all these people who kind of ventured out on their own and just went with their impulses and all landed in somewhere where they found a huge amount of like um, like similar life paths lived that led to the same spot without ever knowing that there were others like them. Like, I think that's mm -hmm. the most inspiring thing to me. Like, especially pre-internet, they just kind of heard rumors, other people sort of like this stuff, and they just kept doing it. Like, that's so it's, cool. It's so raw and so natural, yeah. and there's many times in my life where I wish we could just go back to that sort of era of <laughs> um, things happening through word of mouth and just buzz that overall happened without sort of the influx and onslaught of social media albeit i still respect social media as a way to get our message out to everyone and actually connect with artists like you i mean without social media i probably wouldn't have been able to connect with you but at the same token there's something truly precious about a time before that where everything seemed so natural you know yeah 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 everything was it was like completely sincere in a way because it it just took so much in like certainty to get to the point where you had committed to being a full-time artist there's a lot more of a legacy to stand on top of right now than there was yeah. like when my mom was coming up or like even, yeah. yeah yeah but at the same time I, I still think it's completely like there's so much to be explored and like you said the internet it's just the beginning like it's there's, there's a lot of, of beauty to be made. I think it's just kind of using it as a tool rather than trying to catch up with it or like yeah. finding your own Almost path. Definitely. As we see AI expand, that's a whole other topic we don't need to go down, <laughs> yeah. but I think there's a way to leverage it as a, a really beneficial tool for a lot of people. But I'm also finding from almost a business and marketing perspective that 
people are gravitating towards analog process as well. So with invites, like if you have the patience um, to, you know, send out individual letters to collectors and know their address to invite them to shows, that is going to be received far more graciously than a quick email or a direct message. And it's, it's quite interesting to see that play out and possibly seeing a bit of a balance between analog and digital messaging uh, moving forward. And that's what I truly appreciate about, appreciate about doing physical art shows and producing physical prints. Because for, for Art Rapture, we get a, a tremendous amount of satisfaction uh, and appreciation for art by publishing and producing fine art prints. And when I get those prints in my hand and I hold them up and I see the way that the ink was labored on them, uh, the way in which uh, the 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 how the paper was created, where the paper was from, the weight of the paper, the artist using that as a way to express their themselves and using that type of medium, that signature and that exclusive number. For me, there's there's a great amount of love that goes into printmaking, and you know, for anyone who says you know it's just a print, I immediately go you know it's not just a print it is actually you know a fine work of art and albeit there's always sort of poster quality work out there but we try focus on you know creating that really um wonderful warmth of of what prints should be and it you know it's a pleasure to work with you and i think that's a good segue into going into you know some of the detail and messaging around around the prints that you've created with with Art Rapture for this upcoming print run on on June 9th. This piece to me is definitely like it's a tie together of the the two branches of work that I've been doing, okay. and are both informed from mural practices. And like I was um, basically experimenting with refinement because my whole life I had been like basically taking on more and more, like as I drew, like I got more and more complicated and added like more and more details and all the subject matter. And then at one point, like I decided to try like separate myself from that and subtract completely. And mm. it's kind of just like a conversation between like the, the refinement and then like um, duplication of different elements and how like, yeah, like to me, for instance, like when I went to Rome when I was younger, I was in the catacombs with my mom and we were looking around and they told us about how no one at the time could write um, or like were illiterate. And so all they had were three symbols per a gravestone to like represent that person's entire life. And so like that really from that moment had like been ruminating how important it is to be able to make something like truly connect with you in its simplest form and that doesn't necessarily mean like simplicity is always important but it just means like if there's a simpler way of getting to this it it, it might get to the the heart of things in a true way and so like um doing this is it just kind of tethered together a lot of parallels throughout my life and my thoughts and especially like playing with geometric shapes and like breaking down flowers like it it really like takes you mentally to places that you don't think like simple shapes like have emotional resonance with but like starting to form like a new language of emotional resonance using patterning mixed with animals and and like um, playing with like emotional symbolism like it's it's insane that like it all starts to kind of click into place. So this is a photo we have from the printer in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And we can show the viewers if they're happening to watch this three different color uh, palettes that we have for this print on 290 GSM uh, Coventry rag paper. And as you talk about the simplicity and the messaging, you know, I look at these and I'm a big fan of ancient monolithic uh, uh, um, architecture, buildings, 
uh, type things in Peru and, and Mexico and Egypt and Turkey and anywhere. And as I look at this, I get this, you know, throwback feeling to the type of message that may be inscribed into stone, um, you know, well before, you know, modern day civilization. And one thing I was curious is, do these symbols actually represent any type of letter, number, message, or is this strictly a creative uh, geometric stylistic design that you just happen to use for a border around the print? Yeah, I mean, it basically is just um, like a yin and yang. Like the, the sharp ones are supposed to be like masculine and then the rounded are feminine. And I try to balance those. But yeah, it's an, it's just an exploration of like taking flowers and breaking them down as like a mental practice. Like, but it's definitely informed from when I was a kid, like traveling around the world with my mom and like having this really profound feeling of connection throughout all these different like ancient artworks and like formations that like had now been forgotten, but like that still kind of echoed throughout time and feeling like the world is so much m smaller than we realize. It's just, we don't have mm. like a, a telephone to the other side and like wanting to create like some sort of language that was non-literal that could communicate some sort of essence to me has always been like a profound thing to attempt, like a emotional re relationship with, um, the Kiki and Boba effect was one of the things that also led me to like the, cause I'd already been doing these shapes and kind of like playing with them. And I'm really fascinated how image to me only seemed um, gripping if it had both the, the sharp and round. Yeah, that, that, that's fantastic. And, and you know, what, what are you trying to communicate with this work as we look at not only that sort of yin and yang uh, geometric shape with sharp and round, but also the central, you know, imagery of, you know, the, the four characters, you know, within the middle of the work. And yet the underneath those central figures, the other four uh, heads of, of animals and, and please enlighten us on what these animals are and and what they may mean to you as you communicate a message forward with these yeah so so the like animals i've done in general have all been in efforts to connect humans with how similar and how fascinating the parallels are between us and them because i think it's it's been like a huge compartmentalization that we are in some way different but really like animals in a lot of respects have profound connection with the world that is light years of beyond like where we are um emotionally and um and quite literally and now in the way that we're symbiotic and so like i was fascinated by how every animal had this unique relationship to each other that paralleled out like friends and family and yeah i drew this during a time when i was like just feeling incredibly homesick and and i just had a sister so it just felt like the way that they looked after each other like paralleled the way that i wish i could be in constant connection with my family and yeah it's it's like in some ways like me and my dad and my sister and my mom and and mm. like this yeah this feeling of like um yeah just the yeah, way like that, really, yeah. now that you mentioned that you know it, it's family it's protection it's love it's unity it's caring it's it's yeah. community and um you know i i appreciate that on so many different levels and 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 thank you so much for creating this artwork and explaining that for us as well um what about what about those four four heads is is that is is that a dog what what are those four heads underneath well that symbol has always been like really striking to me like it's been something that since i was a child i've just been obsessed with and like i don't know why i'm just compelled to repeat it okay. like when when i start doodling it's the first thing i do so i think it's just like um 
like this raw archetype of power that like I feel the need to have. It it's manifests into being more like a dog or a deer or any animal, but it's always got like ears and a snout. Mm. And like to me, it's some sort of like mythical like thing that like everyone has in their mind's eye, like that I I feel compelled to put through as a motif as I evolve through my art styles. I just it used to be a fox when I was a kid, but like as I okay. grew up, like it started turning a bit gentler. Okay. And like it could be um, like an alpaca or a llama or yeah, yeah. A I think it manifests. or a dingo <laughs> or you know a wolf. It, it could be so many different things, and I love that you're leaving it quite agnostic and and open to the viewer to interpret, and for a fact that you don't even know yourself exactly what it is, but it it resonates with you and it's something that's stuck with you over time. And uh, man, I, I, I just, I just love it, dude. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. Man. You know, that, that's a great sort of segue into, you know, the details around uh, the print run for people. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining us for this interview and, and sharing uh your sentiments, your background, your communication, uh, your process uh, with us. And, and I know that, you know, as a curator of shows and, and a producer of prints, uh, that, you know, artists really put themselves in a, an extremely vulnerable position whereby, you know, they're creating work for others to critique at a constantly um, every day. And every time they create something new, there's a barrage of of, of warmth and, and critique and whatever the case may be. And you don't always know what type of feedback you're gonna get. But I can tell you this from Art Rapture's perspective and from me, Paul Becker, you know, I'm very, I'm very thankful for you teaming up with us to bring these to the people and to the public. I'm a huge fan of the way we've approached this print run. I think the style of work that you've created and the content that uh, is, is um, under underlying within that creation is paramount and i'm very very excited to uh have these in the art rapture collection and i certainly hope that um the other collectors out there across the world uh, feel the same way and on that note i'll quickly describe how this print run is going to go down so on june 9th we are going to release these prints but there's a caveat only the monochrome and the maroon are available for sale and we have this open until june 11th at 4 pm so in essence there's a weekend period to acquire the works you can acquire one or you can acquire two any collector who acquires both monochrome and maroon will receive the green variation absolutely complimentary so if you acquire both you will get all three so you'll have a, a proper triptych now what we'll also do for collectors is if you collect two and you get the third we'll make sure that you have matching numbers so hypothetically let's say you have number four maroon number four monochrome you will also get number four green to create a proper collectible triptych the edition size is limited, but open for a period of a weekend. So June 9th at 10 a.m. Pacific, they go on sale. We close the sale June 11th at 4 p.m. Pacific. And the amount of people that collect the work determines the edition size. So if 85 people collect monochrome and 60 people collect maroon, that's the edition size. And then let's say of those 60 and 40 people, only 12 collect both. That means the green edition is only out of 12. And then we reserve those early numbers for the people that collected both prints. And therefore, they would get that true quality collectible triptych of this print series, which is very, very cool. The prints are done hand pulled silk screen analog process three color silk screen print bled to the edge of the paper so you have the nice deckled edges of the work so you could frame it floating in a frame or you could frame it with 
acid uh, acid free matting around the actual artwork. They will all be hand signed by Kiyotama. They will all be numbered as well. And uh, they are printed in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we will also have a Art Rapture AR blind stamp on each one. And they will go out for shipping approximately two to four weeks after uh, the, the, the release dates of June 9th to June 11th. I cannot be more excited about this print run and to get my hands on a collection for, for ourselves. I, I thank you so much for joining us, uh, not only for this interview, but for partnering with us on this print run. And I'm, I'm very elated uh, at the quality level of the work that you've created. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you too, man. Appreciate it. everything. It's been so fun like working. I feel like it's been a long time coming, but when we started, it was very synchronistic. Heck yeah. And shout out to Ola Volo, who inspired me to reach out to you uh, when she yeah, met yeah, you I think, at Art Basel like three, four years ago, something like that. And she's like, Paul, you need to work <laughs> with Yatama and check out his stuff. And immediately I was I was drawn in. And I think you you add a real eclecticness and uniqueness to the roster of artists that we've showcased throughout the years and very happy to be uh, running this uh, print release with you. So for all those listening, June 9th, 4 p.m., they go on sale only for a weekend, done, dusted, edition is done at the end of that weekend. So we'll stay tuned on artrapture.com. Our Instagram handle is at artrapture. And uh, do you want to let the people know how they can keep in touch with you? Yeah, Instagram at Kiatama or my website, which is so kiatama.com. Thanks again so much. Enjoy your evening and we'll chat soon, my man. Cool. Take care.